Okay, hi there everybody. <clears throat> In this video we will be learning about exchange rate regimes. Yeah, in that, um, let's get quick over learning goals. In that, we'll be learning about some of the terminology associated with exchange rate regimes. It's a lot of crazy terms, fixed exchange rates, floating exchange rates, dirty floats, uh, um, pegs, so on and so forth. We'll, we'll learn about that terminology. Uh, we'll learn a little bit about 20th century history of exchange rate regimes uh, and, and really to the current day, early 21st too. We'll learn about one of the more notable uh, events in 20th century exchange rate history, particularly the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates. Um, we'll just touch on that, right? It's a super interesting topic. It deserves its lecture in its own right. Uh, we'll do that another time. However, here we'll just show you how it worked. We'll talk about the pros and cons of fixed versus floating exchange rates. So why a nation might choose to fix its currency versus float it, okay? Uh, and then finally, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the mechanics of how a nation uh, fixes an exchange rate. Uh, as we'll see, it's not something that just happens, right? It's something that a nation has to actively pursue. Okay, so uh, as, as, as I suggested a moment ago, right, nations have the choice of how they would like their currencies to exchange, right? It's a, it's a matter of policy for them, uh, how free they want the market for their currency to be. Um, just like if you designed your own currency, right? You, you could design, you could decide, you know, sort of how it's going to change in the marketplace. Okay, now below this, right? So right down there, uh, I have, I just uh, did a quick search, uh, FRED and exchange rates. Uh, so this is the Federal Reserve Economic Database. Uh, if you Google FRED and economic data, it's the first thing that will pop up. And I'm putting this here to encourage uh, my students and others uh, to learn how to get familiar with using this site, right? It's a really, uh, really great site, and I, I strongly encourage uh, you to get familiar with it. If you are a, uh, if you're a practicing economist, you certainly already know how to use this site, right? You're familiar with it, uh, and if you are aspire to doing work in economics of any sort, you should absolutely, um, yeah. Now's the time to learn how to use it. Okay, so. Uh, that's just the start page, right? Those little numbers after daily rate gives you the number of data series that there are for that particular thing. So we can see that uh, there are well over 100, in fact, over 200 uh, data streams associated with exchange rates available at the FRED website. You should check those out. Okay, so quickly, um, the sort of Extremes of exchange rate policy are a floating exchange rate where we allow the market to determine the price of our currency relative to other currencies versus a completely fixed exchange rate where we're going to determine exactly the price that our currency is going to trade for. Okay. Um, <clears throat> nations make that choice, right? Some nations choose to float their currency. For example, the U.S. dollar floats in the foreign exchange. So the price today of the U.S. dollar in terms of euros or in terms of Japanese yen uh, all those prices are determined by supply and relative supply and demand for those currencies uh, in the marketplace. Um, other nations, such as, say, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, um, to some extent China, that's another one that deserves its video on, in its own right, uh, these nations fix their exchange rates. That is to say, the price of their currency in terms of other currencies is uh, a matter of policy by, the, by their governments. So the choice of... Uh, Saudi Arabia to to not uh, float or to fix the real uh, is it's their their choice right and it's something they have to maintain on it every day and so each of these choices has advantages and disadvantages obviously okay or it wouldn't be so um, here we have a bunch of terminology associated with exchange rate regimes and these are uh, listed in order from most flexible or most market based to the least market based so Fully floating exchange rate, uh, as we mentioned, you know, the, the government lets the market determine the price. And you have dirty floats where once in a while a government intervenes, right? All the way up to dollarization, which is where a nation actually utilizes a foreign currency as its own, right? So, okay, so the reason why I have this this list here is to show you that this isn't a binary choice. Uh, nations can choose wholly market-based approaches to their currency or, or the reverse or, or a, a nearly infinite number of options in between. Okay. 
Now, if we look at uh, exchange rate history um, it, from the U.S. perspective, right? So, so from the U.S. perspective, we can really divide the last uh, 100 and, you know, 50 years into really three, three main periods. Uh, the first of those is really before World War I. Uh, excuse me, four main periods. <laughs> first is really before World War I. Um, the second period is really short. Uh, it, in this period, so in the late 19th century, in the early years of the 20th century, uh, gold was the basis of international trade, so international payments were generally conducted, conducted in gold uh, or, or in proxies for gold. And there were some direct substitutes for gold. Um, and, and of course the price of gold was, was determined globally so as a practical matter the relative exchange rates um, of, of, of all, all, all participating currencies are, are fixed in terms of gold and therefore indirectly fixed with each other. Uh, after World War One, you had several countries that are, whose economies is doing quite poorly and what, the, what they try to do is they try to devalue their currency relative to other currencies, that is to make the currency cheap in order to make their exports cheap to try to stimulate their economies. Two was ending. There was a strong shared recognition that, that nobody wanted to return to the system of the interwar years because of the problems. and. Uh, um, of the many institutions to come out of the Bretton Woods system, uh, today we want to talk a little bit about the exchange rates there. So right. post-1973, we have a modern system of floating exchange rates. That is, all those old Bretton Woods countries, the United States, Great Britain, France, Germany, of course, becomes a participant in the system later on. It, Italy, right, all, all the European countries, as well as some of the Asian countries that were part of, part of Bretton Woods eventually, they're all floating exchange rates now. Okay, so this is sort of the new era of, of exchange rates. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the value of global trade. And so you can see this goes back to 1800. Uh, you can see that there's, you know, sort of post-World War II, uh, there's been, you see actually a little dip there in the 1920s and 1930s that, that I mentioned uh, before, right? But you can see that it's t tiny in comparison to global trade today, right? The, the value of, of um, um, global trade today is, is, is just orders of magnitude larger than it was uh, 100 years ago, right? The world is way, way, way more in interconnected today. Okay. Uh, and as a consequence, it re requires a sophisticated system of international payments. Um, you know, the idea, for example, that you would revert to some kind of global gold standard uh, for international trade uh, is just an entirely unrealistic. Um, uh, the gold system of gold system of international trade was problematic 300 years ago with a very limited volume volume of trade. <laughs> you know, you ever ever wonder where all those shipwrecks with gold came from, right? It's like why are all these ships on the bottom of the ocean with gold and now that we're still trying to get at? Well, you know, international payments, right? <laughs> okay, so you know, quickly 1920s again. As I said, this was a period of competitive devaluation where nations were all trying to reduce the value of their currency to stimulate exports, right? Thinking that if we could boost our exports, and we all know that exports are positive on GDP, right? They create domestic incomes. Uh, if we could boost imports, that we could stimulate the economy. Uh, the United States was involved in this process, as well as most of the other participants in the two world wars were involved in this decompetitive process, uh, because it wasn't just the United States that was in uh, depression in the 1930s, it was, it was most of the world. Um, and um, so it was. It, it obviously did not work. Uh, the process of competitive devaluation did not effectively stimulate exports because everybody else was doing the same thing, uh, and the Great Depression persisted globally. Okay. So as I said, by the end of the Second World War, this is this is Bretton Woods, right? So you can you can go stay there still. <laughs> it's in it's in New Hampshire. Um, looks nice. I've never been there. Uh, but uh, yeah, so 1944, it's clear the war is going to be over soon uh, and nobody wants to return to the old system, right? So what had occurred during the 1920s and 30s, everybody recognizes it was destructive, so we got to set up a new system. And the system of international payments that they came up with was the Bretton Woods system. And uh, they also set up these other things over here too, right? So like the World Bank, where, where did it come from? It, Bretton Woods, right? IMF, Bretton Woods, GATT, Bretton Woods, 
system of international payments that we're going to discuss here, Bretton Woods. Okay, if you're interested in all those other things, uh, I, I go over the development and purpose of all those in the 100 level course, introducing macroeconomics. And there's, if there isn't a video there of that, I'll, I'll, I'll put it together soon and I will link it in the link below. Uh, suffice it to say that, that most of the significant institutions pertaining to global trade were set up in the in the final days of World War II to do what? To stabilize the world against future world wars. Seems to have worked pretty good so far, even though we've deconstructed several of these, um, including the system of international payments. All right. All right, so here's how Bretton Woods worked, right? All currencies on the Bretton Woods system were tied at a fixed exchange rate to the U.S. dollar. Now, nations could adjust their exchange rate to the U.S. dollar, um, but uh, it wasn't something they could do completely unilaterally, right? So if a nation decided that the current exchange rate against the dollar was not was causing domestic disturbances in their economy, uh, they could make adjustments they could not make adjustments to try to gain competitive edge in global markets, right? So, uh, so again, not a decision that they can make unilaterally. All right, so all currencies were fixed to the dollar and the dollar was fixed to the price of gold, right? So they're fixed to gold at a specific rate, $35 per ounce. Now, if you're thinking like, wow, that's, that's really cheap compared to today, yeah, it was, okay, and that's, that's part of the story of how Bretton Woods fell apart, but um, but that was the price of, of dollars in terms of gold. And by the Bretton Woods system, uh, you, you would make international payments in U.S. dollars, but uh, you could also convert uh, internationally, right? Not, not domestically, right? So you can't take your U.S. dollars within the United States and convert them for gold um, under Bretton Woods, no. But if you're an international, if you're the government of France, right, and you're owed US dollars for international payments, you could ask for those, that payment in gold rather than, than dollars, okay? Uh, and so it was really a US dollar-based system of exchange rates that was sort of anchored by gold. Uh, not, not a gold standard, uh, really. Gold standards really were all done by the 1930s. Um, it's really been pretty much 100 years at this point since we had any real true gold standards or, or silver standards or, or any other commodity standards for that matter. By the 1960s, uh, you know, there's a lot of strains within the Bretton Woods system. Uh, if you remember your policy trilemma or Triffin's paradox from the previous video, maybe two videos ago, um, you know, this is this is a problem, right? If you if you are trying to maintain domestic monetary policy, which the United States certainly was during the 1950s and 60s, as well as other nations within the Bretton Woods system were, uh, and if you're trying to maintain a fixed exchange rate at the same time, uh, you're going to create a lot of uh, pressures in terms of international the international system of payments. And uh, what happened is that there was uh, really excess supply of U.S. dollars and uh, insufficient supply of gold. I remember that price from a moment ago uh, in the global marketplace and uh, you know the US was hesitant to release gold and uh, international uh, other international uh, groups were uh, demanding increasing amount of gold and less US dollars uh, by the late 1960s some nations start leaving the system out of out of um, you know it doesn't offer them sufficient flexibility uh, and so, so they bail on it right 71, 72 uh, nations come on, come off the Bretton Woods system. It's clear that it's really starting to break down. And by 1973, then President Nixon uh, decouples the dollar from gold. So, so eliminates the convertibility, international convertibility into gold, and that's effectively the end of the Bretton Woods system. Uh, after 1973, then nations start floating their exchanges Great Britain, the United States, France, Japan, Germany, Canada, etc., Australia, all these countries start floating their formerly been part of the Bretton Woods system, start floating their currency. Okay. Um, so in today, right, we, we have all these sort of 
old school countries that I just mentioned, right, are all sort of floating exchange rate regimes. But then there are, are many other nations, smaller nations, like as I mentioned, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, so on and so forth, Iraq, uh, all these nations operate with fixed exchange rate regimes. So let's say that I want to fix my exchange rate for, for whatever reason. Um, well, I'll talk, tell me the short version of the reason why you'd want to fix exchange rate is because you're uh, you're more concerned about volatility in international markets than you are in domestic markets. So, if I'm concerned about you know local inflation or deflation or unemployment and employment uh, due to local demand, right? That then I want stable interest rates, right? So I want monetary policy. <laughs> uh, I want stable prices. Uh, I want predictable business environment within the economy. So I'm more concerned about fixing interest rates, right? Whereas, you know, if my economy is relatively small and I depend uh, very heavily on revenue from exports, uh, well, then, you know, then I, I need to predict, um, you know, how much money is going to come in from those exports. And if I've got exchange rate volatility, that's a big problem for me. Uh, so smaller economies, less developed economies that are more dependent upon the foreign sector uh, for local incomes, uh, they tend to fix exchange rates because they're more concerned about exchange rate volatility than they are about uh, localized inflation or, or deflation. Uh, so, so the trade-off of losing monetary policy becomes a costly one, but, but, but one that they, they choose to make. How does a nation fix exchange rate? Well... It's very similar to how a central bank conducts open market operations or the conventional channel, which through monetary policy is conducted, most conventional channel. Um, if, if a nation uh, notices that the, the, their exchange rate is uh, appreciating relative to another currency, that is their, their currency is becoming more expensive relative to the currency they want to fix it to, well, then, then what they do is they just sell their currency in the market to bring it down. Right. So you can imagine, you know, if some kids out there are selling lemonade on the street corner and, you know, you decide the price of lemonade is too high. Well, you just walk out to the corner and you start selling lemonade. Right. Bring the price down. Conversely, if they notice their currency is becoming too cheap relative to some other currency, uh, they need to buy it up and they need to buy it up with the currency that they're fixing against. So if I wish to keep the price of my currency in terms of U.S. dollars stable, and I notice my currency is getting too cheap, well, what I need to do is I need to go out there and start buying up my own currency and buying it up with the currency I want to fix to, which in this case would be U.S. dollars. So if if you're thinking like, geez, well, where, where do I, you know, where do, where do you get all those U.S. dollars from? Well, well, you sell goods and services to people in the United States. So... You know, if now you're thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, so Saudi Arabia fixes against U.S. dollar. Does that mean they need to hold a lot of U.S. dollars to maintain their fixed exchange rate? Absolutely. Okay. And you might be saying, well, where did Saudi Arabia get all those? Well, <laughs> did you put gas in your car last week? <laughs> okay. All right. So you paid in U.S. dollars. So if you're thinking like, geez, that sounds like a raw deal for the Saudis. So I get gas from my car. I give them U.S. dollars. And then they have to use some of those U.S. dollars just to maintain their own currency. They don't actually get anything for it. Yeah, uh, this is why developed nations tend to not fix their exchange rates because it's costly, right? So it's uh, it's not a not a free policy. A monetary policy is in some sense free. Um, in, in this sense, it's free. Uh, exchange rates are are not not free, right? And so uh, nations generally tend to leave them uh, when they can, right? So. Uh, China is a great, great case. This, right? China was very fixed exchange rate regime and has become more flexible and will continue to become more flexible uh, going forward. Pros and cons: fixed exchange rate, floating exchange rates. Pro of a floating exchange rate: you get uh, it's, it's free, right? So you don't need to do anything, right? Uh, and of course, you also get to operate in an effective domestic monetary policy, right? And so, you know, if you're not very concerned about volatility in foreign markets you know if you don't really care how much harley davidson sell for in europe or in you know wherever in venezuela uh, if you're not really concerned about you know what's happening to the price of imports here and there because most of your economy is domestic which is certainly the case for the united states then you know that that looks like a pretty good trade-off when you look at those pros and the cons 
uh, shifting over to the other side over there, fixed exchange rates, pros and cons. You know, the big con of a fixed exchange rate is it's expensive. You have to hold a lot of foreign currency and that foreign currency doesn't come free. You need to go to work, make stuff and sell it to people and then get that foreign currency. Of course, the pro of it is you stabilize your foreign sector, right? So, um, you know, you, you can make the prices of your imports and exports sort of stay where you want them to be. So if your businesses are highly dependent upon exporting their goods, you can ensure them, you know, stable revenues over periods of time. And if your consumers are dependently dependent on imported goods and services, you, you can ensure them relative price stability of those imports, right? So here are some reasons, some specific examples of, of why uh, nations utilize fixed exchange rates in, in the real world. And then on right below here, is 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 a quick link right to the if you just search like fixed exchange rate and wikipedia right wikipedia comes up with a nice list of all countries that have fixed exchange rates so here's some stuff about the chinese central bank the chinese story you know i'm not going to go to suffice to say china has has effectively two two currencies right they have an internal currency and a foreign currency uh and the foreign currency they uh, try to fix its exchange rate and the local currency they try to fix interest rates right so suffice to say it's an, it's an interesting right it's it's unique right it's literally unique in the sense there's no other country that does it like china <laughs> all right so i'm going to move this uh myself over to the other corner so you can see this because it's good stuff all right over there now right here is some recent history on the venezuelan bolivar uh, so, so I've told you a moment ago how you maintain a fixed exchange rate, which implies that you as activists, right, you have to do something, which then also implies like, oh, if you don't do that thing, it'll break, right? Or you can't do that thing, it'll break. Do we have examples of that? Yes, yes, we do have examples of that. It's right here, right? So, like, what happened? What would happen if, say, Saudi Arabia went, ran out of dollars, right, and they couldn't maintain their fixed exchange rate? Oh, what would happen? This would happen. Nope, nope, that would happen. Okay. All right, so this is 2018, uh, 2016 through 2018. This is the Venezuelan Boulevard against the US dollar. Uh, this is just from the FRED site. Again, you should learn to use it so you can do stuff like this and see how it's all working. Uh, in late 2015, we see, well, first of all, you can see these sort of straight lines, right? That's a fixed exchange rate, because right? <laughs> it's fixed. We can see that in 2015, uh, late 2015, the Venezuelan government devalued the bolivar from uh, 6.25 uh, bolivars to U.S. dollars at the, up to 10, right? So they made the bolivar cheaper. Why? Because they couldn't afford to maintain the old exchange rate. Um, falling oil prices, don't you know? Uh, the graph below, uh, same exchange rate, right? Um, uh, 2018 forward, right? So this is through through you know, like March of this year, right? It's pretty recent data. Um, you can see that 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 looks like around first quarter, second quarter, somewhere somewhere spring 2018. Uh, the the bowl of our collapses against the dollar, so its value goes to goes to you know 280. So it's 10 to one to start with, right? So it's 10 to one. January 2018 is 10 to one. Uh, by August, it looks like it's uh, about 250,000 to one. <laughs> so to total collapse of the currency against the dollar. Um, they retain control of it then, as you can see in um, you know mid 2018. Uh, excuse me, late 2018, uh, and then then gradually lose control of it again in uh, 2019. All right. So here they're maintaining a fixed exchange rate: 15, 16, 17 early 18 then they lose control of it they can't afford to maintain it anymore they regain control of it for a short period of time and then then start to lose it again okay um so so as you can see you know the, the fixed exchange rate is just something that just happens it's something you have to actively maintain so as i say you know most it's kind of a pain to fix a currency right it's it's what's well, more than kind of a pain it's a, it's a big pain and so, you know, most nations would prefer to float their exchange rates if, if they could, right? Um, it's generally seen as a, as a second best policy when compared to a floating exchange rate. Okay, that's it for today. Um, we'll see you again next time. Uh, take care, hope everybody's doing great.